Good morning. Today is January the 18th, 2023. I hope everybody has had a good day so far. Uh, I'm making a number of videos about a very important month in history. Uh, that was the month of January uh, of 1973, 50 years ago. One of my major sources is this book, uh, January 1973, Watergate, Roe v. Wade, Vietnam, and the Month That Changed America Forever by James Robinault. It's a good book. However, one event of that month that this book co totally overlooks occurred 50 years ago today in Washington, D.C., the Hanafi murders, and this led to an act of revenge four years later. The title of this book is American Caliph, the, or Caliph, the true story of a Muslim mystic, a Hollywood epic, and the 1977 siege of Washington. Uh, Shahan Mufti is the author. Another excellent book. Now, um, on this day 50 years ago, I was in the last semester of my senior year at Baylor. I don't know uh, what day classes began for the spring semester. Uh, so I was either going to class this day or getting ready to go to class, you know, depending on when classes started. It was just four, year, four days earlier that I had uh, had a very negative experience in being voted out by the Whitney Missionary Baptist Church, my first uh, pastorate. And I don't recall hearing this particular incident on the news uh, that day. It was uh, a couple of years later when I was doing research for my master's thesis on the nation of Islam that I came across uh, references to these murders that took place in 1973. And I have a, a brief section of my thesis about the Hanafi murders, uh, but... Uh, I don't go into detail about it. Of course, keep in mind, uh, the 1970s was before the internet developed. So uh, my source of, to write on that today, there would be a lot more available than there were 50 years ago. That's true with most any subject you can name. <clears throat> but uh, I... Um, One of dealing with there's a lot of background this this book provides to the people involved in this. Um, at, uh, on January 18th, 1973, this was the deadliest mass murder in the history of Washington, D.C. up until that time. It occurred at the Hanafi Madhab Center. And uh, this was, this house was owned by the basketball star Karim Abdul Jabbar. And during the time I was writing my thesis on the Nation of Islam, better known as Black Muslims, I would often make the remark that Muhammad Ali is a Black Muslim, you know, who formerly known as Cassius Clay. And someone would say, yes, so is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That is not true. Uh, yes, he was black. Yes, he was Muslim, but he was not a member of the Nation of Islam. He was a member of a rival group. At one time, however, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had as much devotion to his spiritual leader, Hamas Abdul Khalis, as Muhammad Ali had to Elijah Muhammad. But... Uh, this leader, Khalees, received much media attention between 1973 and 1977. And uh, points out here in the book that this black man, descended from slaves, 
born two years before the global Islamic caliphate fell in the aftermath of the First World War, came to acquire the title of Kali for himself. And uh, he was uh, born uh, in Gary, Indiana, this man was. And he... Uh, His birth name was Ernest McGee. Uh, McGee um, was spelled M-C-G-H-E-E. -E. And um, there were some Muslims in Gary at that time, but he was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist. And he became a very accomplished musician. He attended Purdue University. And while there, he converted to Roman Catholicism. Much to the displeasure of his father, who was a very devoted Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he served a while in the military, but began to experience psych psychiatric problems. Uh, and... Uh, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and discharged from the army. But he was able to manipulate the system in order to obtain money from the GI Bill. When he left Gary, Indiana, he had dreams of greatness, or maybe they were delusions of grandeur. I'll leave, leave that up for you to judge. He married a woman named Ruby Copeland. And uh, at the Church of the Annunciation in Harlem on December 31st, 1946. And at the time, uh, he say he was a musician. And he lived for a while in Harlem, which had become a mecca for jazz at the time. In August of 1947, his son, Ernest McGee Jr., was born. And... It was in the spring of 1951, about the same time that I was born, that Khalees received a bachelor's in social science from the City College of New York. And again, he got some money from the GI Bill to go to school. There's a discussion here of jazz and Islam, the relationship. A number of Muslims in America, or Americans who converted to Islam, have been musicians of various types, including jazz. And uh, many saw Islam as a religion of black empowerment. And by the time he attended Columbia University, enrolled in the course in Near Eastern Studies, he began calling himself a Muslim. It also has a chapter devoted to the rise of the black Muslims, the nation of Islam, and discusses uh, two organizations that preceded them. According to many scholars, the antecedents, uh, there were both a political and a religious antecedent to the nation of Islam. The, relig the political antecedent was the United Negro Improvement Association led by Marcus Garvey. The religious antecedent was the Moorish Science Temple led by Noble Drew Ali. And I uh, have done a couple of videos about the Moorish Science Temple. I hope you'll check them out. But there appeared in the Paradise Valley of Detroit mm -hmm. a man that uh, began selling door-to-door -door in this uh, African-American community, he sold raincoats, and later sold silks. He was a mystery man. He was light-skinned. Some believed he was white. Some believed he was an Arab. Uh, he's been various claims. have been born in Pakistan, India, New Zealand, uh, and he was also... Um, 
Um, some considered he was a light-skinned black man from the South. But the mosque in the Highland Park neighborhood had existed in Detroit since the early 1920s. And many Arabs had settled into Dearborn, Michigan nearby, which has a very large Muslim population today. Most of these were Arabs and others from the Middle East. And uh, it was later that African-Americans began to convert. But the black families far met had little or no exposure to Islam as practiced by the Arab immigrants. The Arab immigrants were trying to move up in the world and identifying with black people would not have served that purpose. So uh, they adopted many of the white ways. And, but, but this man, some people referred to him as David Ford, Wallace Ford, Wallace D. Ford, Ford or Farrard, Wallace Farrard Muhammad, and he, he preached and taught in the early 1930s, disappeared in 1934. And one of his major converts was a, a man from Sandersville, Georgia, named Elijah Poole, who took the name Elijah mm -hmm. Muhammad, who led the Nation of Islam from Farb's disappearance in 1934 until his death in 1975. Now, Timothy, rather, uh, Ernest McGee, known as a Hamas Abdul Khalis, first heard of Elijah Muhammad at Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem. And um, he demanded justice, but the, he was having some problems at the time. This author says that just as Khalis was filling the embrace of the nation of Islam, he was being pushed away by the nation of his birth. And um, the GI Bill was written by mostly white lawmakers. And there's a good possibility that when they wrote this bill that they had white soldiers primarily in mind. A lot of non-white soldiers have taken advantage of it, and that's good. But he had some problems with continuing the funding from the GI Bill. He got a job with the U.S. Postal Service. And then at Harlem Temple Number no. 7, he met Malcolm X, who was formerly Malcolm Little, eventually known as al Hodge Malik El-Shabazz, uh, who was the national spokesman for Elijah Muhammad. And on Malcolm's recommendation, Elijah appointed Khalees to head the University of Islam in Chicago. And there's also a story about the Sheikh, the Zaman Mustafa Akkad, traveled from Aleppo, Syria to Los Angeles in hope of becoming a filmmaker. I'm not gonna go into detail about him, but he produced a movie that was extremely controversial at the time. It is, is, it was eventually shown and it is available on YouTube for anybody who's interested. Calling, it's called uh, Muhammad, the Messenger of God. He tried to give an accurate portrayal of Islam because of so many distorted uh, views of Islam in the media but many Muslims found it offensive, and that played a, a role in uh, what was going on here. The, uh, now, the Sunnis, the Orthodox Muslims, denounced not the Nation of Islam as a heretical sect. Uh, After W.D. Farrar disappeared, uh, he had previously been called a prophet, but they concluded he was God. And 
Allah God came in the person of W. Farrard Muhammad, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and Mahdi of the Muslims. And uh, he, uh, Elijah, took the role of prophet. Now, in Orthodox Islam, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. And after Muhammad, there can be no prophets. That's where prophethood ended. And uh, the successors were known as caliphs or uh, the uh, caliphas or uh, the spiritual leaders are, ca are called imams and successors to the prophet. But that, but, and the claim that all white people are devils and all blacks are divine is not taught in the Quran. So in many ways, the nation of Islam is at variance with what most Muslims believe. Wallace D. Muhammad, uh, son of Elijah Muhammad, converted to Orthodox Islam. He was in and out of the nation for many years. And in 1961, he was sentenced to prison for draft evasion. He studied the Quran while he was incarcerated. And there had been a falling out between Elijah and Malcolm X. Wallace confirmed his father had children with secretaries, some of whom had been uh, converted to the Nation of Islam by Malcolm X. Malcolm was originally, eventually suspended. November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. The whole country was in, in mourning. Elijah ordered his ministers not to comment on the assassination. And, at a, and then... After delivering a speech, Malcolm was asked what he thought about the assassination. He described it as chickens coming home to roost. And he was suspended, but Malcolm had traveled all over the country and other places, giving speeches on college campuses, and he was certainly more popular then than Elijah. And there was probably some jealousy involved here. And on he he in, after his pilgrimage to Mecca. Malcolm embraced Orthodox Islam and rejected the black nationalism of his father. Well, what happened after this? Well, Maha, um, you know, of course, on February the 21st, 1965, at the Audubon Ballroom in New York, uh, Malcolm X was assassinated. And he and Wallace had been friends. As I say, it was after the assassination that... Uh, Wallace came back to the movement and submitted to his father, even though he no longer believed in many of the things his father was teaching. And But Hamas Abdul Khalis, he had embraced the Hanafi sect of Orthodox Islam. And his own movement received a major financial shot in the arm when a seven-foot-two college basketball star from UCLA named Louis Alcindor converted to Islam and took the name of Karim Abdul-Jabbar. Alcindor was like many. He became interested in Islam as, re, as a result of reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, a book written by Alex Haley through, with cooperation of Malcolm X. I read that book for the first time in 1972, and I agree with one of my professors. It was one of the most important books of the 20th century. And Alcindor attended Cleveland Summit in support of Muhammad Ali's decision to refuse the military draft. And uh, if competing with Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam was the aim, Khalees was at one point lagging far behind. But after Malcolm X was assassinated, Muhammad Ali became Elijah's uh, new poster boy. And in some ways, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played the same role in the Hanafi movement as Muhammad Ali did with the Nation of Islam. Um, 
and even you know he certainly gave them a lot of money and kept them going and the term in Arabic Karim Abdul Jabbar docile servant of the enforcer it says something right there uh, he was had a pretty strong control while he stood over the movement I understand when uh, uh, Jabbar was raised a Catholic in Queens and his parents did not convert to Islam. And as a result, when he was, he got married, uh, Hamas Abdul Khalis did not allow Karim's parents to attend the wedding. Khalis worked for a while for, for the Urban League, but got laid off. And uh, and again, the book goes into different, describes different things, uh, including uh, various Islamic leaders in Washington and uh, Akkad, the filmmaker, but we're getting down now to January 18th, 1973, 50 years ago today. When the phone rang at the Anafi Center about 8 o'clock in the morning, on January 18th, 1973, it was unusually busy at the house. Uh, and there, by the way, by this time, uh, Khalees had become a polygamist, taking other wives besides his his first wife. And he had been sending letters to ministers in the Nation of Islam speaking negatively against Elijah Muhammad. And the Nation of Islam in Philadelphia had uh, been close ties with what was known as the Black Mafia, uh, known for their violent activities. On January 18th, when the Black Mafia arrived in Washington, the city was anticipating the inauguration, second inauguration of President Richard Nixon two days later, who had won a landslide re-election victory in no, on November 7th of uh, 1972. But these guys came there to the Hanafi home. They were really after Khalees, but he was clearly not at home. The fact that he wasn't at home is why he lived to talk about all this. And later that day, Khalees and the police found seven dead Hanafis. Amina, one of his wives, said these men who killed him were Elijah's people. And the youngest was a child about eight days old of the victims. One of the members of the Black Mafia protested, saying that this child is too young to testify in court. But the leader said he must be killed because he has within him the seat of the hypocrite. On January the 20th, seven Hanafis were buried at the Lincoln Memorial Cemetery in Maryland. And uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar flew in from Milwaukee uh, for the service. The first thing Kareem did after returning to Milwaukee was to buy a shotgun. Khalees came on to the Today Show and talked against the Nation of Islam. He recounted how the nation's followers were caught by TV cameras celebrating rejoicing at the funerals of the Anafis. Mohammed Speaks newspaper of the Nation of Islam shortly afterward ran a cartoon 
of Khalees receiving cash from a cigar smoking TV producer and asking, how was my act? Uh, the case eventually went to trial. It was on August 16, 1973. By this time, I had graduated from Baylor, and I was working that summer as a door-to-door -door Bible salesman in Pulaski, Virginia. Uh, by that time, with a grand jury in Washington, indicted seven members of the Nation of Islam, Temple Number no. Seven, and who were also members of the Black Mafia. And a lot of things went on that year, including the October War between Israel and Egypt, in which Islam, of course, uh, hit the public eye again. And. A man named Earl Silbert was the came the lead prosecutor in the Anafi case. He previously did some prosecuting of Watergate, but he was charged that he was he'd failed to connect the dots all the way back to the White House. And there were problems related to this new film Muhammad in various Arab countries during this time. And Some of these men were eventually convicted, and um, they didn't get the justice that Khalees felt like they should have been, been given. It was on March 9th of 1977 that Hamas Abdul Kali struck back. He was offended by the release of the movie Muhammad, Messenger of God, considering it blasphemous. He held hostages there during that time. Nearly 50 million Americans, a quarter of the country's population, got their news from the national evening broadcast. They all now knew about Hamas Abdul Khalis and about the murder carried out by Elijah Muhammad in 1973. They also learned about the biopic of Muhammad and about Khalis's jihad, holy war, against it. Khalis was finally achieve what he wanted. He was the best known Muslim in America. And but he made some impossible demands. Okay. He spelled out on uh, Max Robbins's live bro broadcast, two had already been met. The movie had been pulled from the screens though the prints of the film were still in Akkad's possession. 
he had made a bold offer to the Washington police offering to screen the movie for police and the men inside the B'nai B'rith. After watching it, if they still objected, Akkad vowed that he would burn the film. While this may have been priceless publicity for the film, uh, the police were not sold on the idea and had rejected Akkad's offer and told him to stay away from Washington. Meanwhile, Joe O'Brien, chief of homicide, had delivered an envelope of $750 to the Nafi Center, which he had handed Khalees' wife, Khadija, at the door. And this was uh, a fine he had paid you know, in court that he felt was unjust. That money was refunded, and the film was at least temporarily stopped. Khalees' final demand is insistent that the killers of his family, as well as the men who murdered uh, Malcolm X be delivered to him was the most difficult. There was no chance uh, for them to be handed over to police for execution. On the question, no one, not the Washington police or the mayor, nor the attorney general, nor the FBI chief, had any way to deliver. Khalees had made a demand that appeared to be unfulfillable. Most importantly, all suspected Khalees knew that it was impossible. But he asked it anyway. He also wanted uh, to take action against Muhammad Ali and Wallace D. Muhammad. He referred to them as Cassius Clay and Wallace X. Eventually, the ambassadors from Iran, Egypt, and Pakistan intervened. The ambassador from Egypt uh, got personal permission from President Amor Sadat to play a role in negotiations here. Uh, there was um, Ambassador Khan from Pakistan was one of those, but it was an odd situation. They may have been Muslims, but Khalees was an American Muslim descended from slaves. Khan was a foreign Muslim descended from royalty. And he, Khalees, rejected the offer that could have been arranged of exile in another country. Um, and It's interesting, the history of martial law, it was proclaimed by Lincoln during the Civil War by Lyndon Johnson after the MLK assassination and by Jimmy Carter during the Hanafi siege. It's interesting that at the time of the Hanafi siege, that was in March of 77, Jimmy Carter had not been in office quite two months. He had he had no way of knowing that his presidency would be eventually defined by another hostage crisis uh, with uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, which was a major factor in his defeat for re-election in 1980. By the way, Khalees resented the label black Muslim. But they held people at the uh, headquarters of the B'nai B'rith, the Jewish Fraternal Order, at the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C., and at another place. And they were threatening to execute people if their demands were not met. And It had been right in between the two events of, you know, January 73 when the murders took place and uh, March of 77 when the, when Khalees struck back 
It was on February the 25th of 1975 that Elijah Muhammad had passed away. And his son Wallace took over. And the FBI sensed that Wallace had a desire to clean up his father's organization and bring it, it uh, up above board. He brought the movement in line with Orthodox Islam. And police wanted to be recognized as the most important Muslim in America, the American Caliph. He saw himself as a soldier of Islam and as the executor of Allah's divine will. And there were some debates, discussions with the ambassadors from Egypt, Pakistan, and Iran. The ambassadors quoted the Quran in the negotiations. And someone raised the question, was Khalees confusing his own desire for revenge with the uh, justice of Allah? And the ambassador from Iran told a story that... Uh, had the theme of forgiveness. And after lengthy dialogue with the ambassadors, Khalees finally decided to release all the hostages. And he was actually, when he was finally arrested, he surrendered. He was released on his own recognizance. He had two months to build his profile, present his case to the court of public opinion. And uh, in only two days, Khalees had gone from a fringe figure in American Islam to the most widely known American Muslim. Church bells rang as the hostages were, fee were freed. Mayor Walter Washington declared the Lord was on our side. Police returned to his home. As far as the film on Muhammad, the siege had actually brought the film in valuable publicity. And Khalees received a threat from Rabbi Meir Kahani of the Jewish Defense League. Uh, he eventually, by the way, went to Israel and got elected to the Knesset, but he was eventually kicked out because his extreme uh, views were contrary to Israel's anti-discrimination laws. The goal of uh, the Jewish Defense League, among other things, was to expel all Arabs from Israel. And it was in 1990 that Kahani was assassinated while giving a speech at a synagogue in Brooklyn. And the JDL actually held a march on, in front of the Hanafi Center on March 20th, 1977. Kahani finally gave up on coaxing Khalees out, he knew he wasn't coming out. And uh, one of the conditions for release was not to speak to the media, but he spoke through intermediaries and the Hanafis remained in the news.
on March 31st, 1977, the day of Khalees' preliminary hearing, Khalees and Wallace Muhammad declared a truth, a truce. There was a black attorney and former judge named Harry Alexander who ended up representing Khalees in court. It was on April the 4th, 1977, just four days after Khalees was locked up, the Egyptian President Anwar Sadat landed at Andrews Air Force Base in Virginia to begin an official state visit. Two decades after the Suez Crisis, when America began policing the Middle East, the country was more deeply enmeshed in Middle East politics than ever. Now Carter and Sadat, two religious men seemingly concerned with the fate of the Holy Land, were attempting to write what appeared to be a new chapter for the region. It would be two years later that uh, the Camp David Accords would be signed, and Jimmy Carter, a born-again Christian, would bring this Muslim leader, Anwar Sadat, and the Jewish Prime Minister, Menachem Begin, to the peace table in a wonderful ceremony in Washington, D.C. The Anafi trial began May 31st, 1977. The jury was all black, eight women and four men. None of them were Muslim. The federal government had to prove conspiracy because uh, one of the people involved, Abdul Muzikar, was miles away uh, from 10 of the others when uh, he killed Maurice Williams. He was the only person killed during this time. Several people were wounded uh, during the crisis, including uh, Washington, D.C. City Councilman and future Mayor Marion Berry. And... Uh, Some of the hostages experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, as many people have experienced in both military and non-military situations. And um, the verdict was handed down at 1.30 p.m. July 23, 1977, after nearly 20 hours of deliberation. They informed the judge they reached a final verdict. An hour later in the courtroom, the judge asked Khalees if he had anything to say to the court before the verdicts were announced. Khalees rose from his seat and read from a prepared statement. He was found guilty. And Police was given 41 to 123 years in prison, meaning he would almost certainly spend most spend the rest of his life behind bars. Editorial in the Washington Star, September 11th, 1977, declared we have had enough of terrorism. Little did the writer know that September 11th would go down in history as synonymous with terrorism. <clears throat> and while a cod was fil filming this controversial movie in Libya, mm -hmm. Iran was being swept by a revolution led by the Shia Muslim cleric, uh, the Ayatollah Rahullah Khomeini. And November 4th, 1979, the uh, 
Iranian hostage crisis occurred. America was held hostage for 444 days. Prior to this time, many Americans viewed Islam as an exotic faith that had little re relevance to their lives. And uh, on November 17, 1979, from his prison cell, Hamas Abdul Khalis wrote a letter to the Ayatollah Khomeini. My dear brother in Islam, I kiss your hand although I'm a thousand miles away in prison. He praised the Iranian leader for building a new generation. Khalis too had once held hostages also to prevent mockery of our faith. He also claimed that he, how his explain how his family members have been martyred for opposing the nation of Islam, who used Islam as a joke. Hamas asked you in the name of Allah to let the hostages go, American or otherwise. It was, he argued, the way to achieve your spiritual objectives. He then he asked Khomeini to sp spread the word that your brother in America asked you in the name of Allah to do this. He signed off your brother Khalifa Hamas Abdul Khalis. The Muslim Students Association urged the government to dispatch Khalis to Tehran as a hostage negotiator. Uh, of course, they didn't do that. And unfortunately, Khomeini did not uh, do as Khalis had besieged him in the letter. And As I said earlier, Sadat and Begum were brought to the peace table by Jimmy Carter. And one of Carter's staff members after this made the statement, if this doesn't get us reelected, nothing will. Well, unfortunately, the hostage crisis in which Jimmy Carter appeared to be weak and in, inept in handling it was a major factor that resulted in his defeat in 1980. In fact, it wasn't until January 20th of 1981, when right after Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, that the hostages were finally released. And uh, Ted Koppel interviewed Khalees on January 18, 1983, 10 years after the murder of his family. He failed to mention this anniversary being the 10th anniversary, though. Uh, 1983 Viewpoint was the last time Khalees was seen by the public. On 9-11, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon passed almost directly over the Lorton Correctional Complex where Khalees was held at the time. And some of Bin Laden's Demands echoed that of Khalees. A number of efforts were made to uh, have Khalees released on parole, including one by former Attorney General Ramsey Clark. Many people, including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, visited Khalees in prison. And it was by the time the plane flew overhead on September 11th that Khalees was finally scheduled for a geriatric parole hearing. On March 11th, 2002, six months after 9-11 and 25 years after the end of the hostage crisis, Khalees was again denied parole. Khalees died on November 13th, 2003. Uh, he was incarcerated at Butner uh, near Durham, North Carolina. And uh, Wallace Muhammad uh, died five years later. His funeral was held on September 11th, 2008. Uh, during this time, uh, 
that was talking about building a mosque and some other facilities near the World Trade Center. It's sometimes called the Ground Zero Mosque. It never materialized. Um, this term, this became a test for President Obama and uh, later future President Donald Trump offered to buy the property. Fifty years ago today, his family was murdered. Four years later, he struck back. What kind of legacy does Khalees, Ab Hamas Abdul Khalees leave? For all this and more, the Anafi Madhab Center still stands on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. What remains is primarily a family compound housing the descendants of Khalees, his earliest Sanafi followers. Though not a community in any religious sense, they still hold communal prayers, though outsiders are not always welcome. There's no one from the community who has any real, real religious leadership there today. Khalees' children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are musicians and artists. Uh, he was a musician, a drummer. Some are lawyers, dentists, and doctors. Others are employed in state and federal government. Some, some still drive cabs, as many Muslims have done. They tend to the Khalifa's grave and visit it frequently to pray and ponder. An American flag still hangs on the outs, uh, inside of the center. Uh, one difference between the Hanafis and the Nation of Islam, the Hanafis always considered themselves to be Americans, even though they didn't agree with a lot of the things going on in the country, whereas the Nation of Islam wanted their own state separate from America. Uh, so this is an excellent study of an important event of a number of important events, but January 18th, 1973, the tragic murders of the family of Hamas Abdul Khalis in Washington, D.C., led to the hostage taking four years later and get, got Islam in the news more and more. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. And I recommend this book for anybody who's interested. I hope everybody has a wonderful January the 18th, 2023. See you later.